On April 1st of 2007, at around 1.30 p.m., Andrew Mari, who was from Inglewood Family Bloods, was driving with his friend, Kenneth Frisian, on 94th Street near Gramercy in Los Angeles, California, in an area claimed by the rival Rolling 90 neighborhood Cribs. Well, as he was driving, Mari saw Michael Lee Hall, whom he recognized as a member of the Rolling 90s, on the block. The two made brief eye contact, and right after that, Hall reaches for his waistband. So Mari, he stepped on the gas and ducked as he passed Hall. While ducking, he heard several shots fired into his car as the rear window of the car shattered. Mari quickly turns on the street and hits a few corners, but when he looks over, he notices that Frisian wasn't moving. He had just been shot in the back of the head, and unfortunately, he died from his wounds. Tony McClendon belonged to the neighborhood of Roller 90 Crips, and New Hall was also a member of the gang. McClendon witnessed the shooter from an alley about a block away while he was with another Roller 90s Crip member, Charles Fowler. McClendon claimed he saw Hall pointing what appeared to be a handgun at the car that was moving slowly, and then saw puffs of smoke coming from the gun. He says Hall then ran past 94th Street in between some houses. Also, Cleeton Douglas, who lived in the 90s territory at 1930 West 94th Street, a car drove up while he was standing outside his house. The front passenger told him to get a pistol that was hidden in a small space in the backyard of a house a few houses down. But instead of looking for the gun, he goes in the house. About 90 minutes after the shooting, Tony McLean returned to the alley and saw Hall. Hall said that he had done a shooting and that Creighton might have picked up the gun from where he left it in the backyard by Creighton's house. But at around 9.15 p.m. on the day of the shooting, police found a 9mm semi-automatic handgun between a wall and a garage at 1910 West 94th Street. 11 9mm shell casings were found at the shooting scene, all of which, according to ballistics testing, were fired from that gun. Ultimately, Hall was found guilty of the murder and sentenced to a term of 59 years to life in state prison. As you're about to see in this episode, as we address the neighborhood of the 90 Crips, this gang has a reputation in the city for being one of the most ruthless and war-ready factions around. They're known for bloody wars with several gangs, especially the a Trey Gangsters and the Hoovers. Two cars, that this gang actually used to be a part of, had several national drug rings, and have been in the headlines for several other situations. So they definitely have a story to tell. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Cali's Most Dangerous. Let's get into it. Fellow Crips, veterans of the new wave of gang terrorism. If they don't all die, it's still it's just gonna still be a few. Cause then they'd come back and shoot us up, right? So we just go through their sneak attack, shoot them up and get on by the business. Chapter one, history of the neighborhood Rolling 90 Cribs. The neighborhood Rolling 90 Cribs have a history with a lot of twists and turns when it comes to the current status of the game. Starting off as a faction of the West Side Cribs, they would develop their identity as the 90s in around 1976 or 77. But here's the thing, after a brief period of just going by the West Side 90s, some of the rolling 90s actually start off as gangster cribs and some were 9 0 -overs. With the help of founder Marcus Baker, the West Side Rolling 90 gangster cribs were established. Sounds crazy, right? But this was way earlier in the gang's history. And truth be told, that identity, it didn't last long. The rolling 90 cribs were definitely gangsters and Hoovers back in the days. But they never really got along with the other gangster Crips in the first place. They used to hang out at St. Andrews Park, which is a known gangster Crip hangout spot, but it was always tension amongst the gangs. They've been outnumbered, down near 100 to 1, and with conflicts occurring between the 90s and the gangster Crips down there daily, the rolling 90s, who had already met up at Jesse Owens Park, made their hangout, which also helped jumpstart the separation from the gangster Crip car. And by 1983, with the death of a prominent member, Sweet Tooth, they dropped the Hoover and the Gangsta Crip identity from their name. And for a short time, they went by the West Coast Crips. By around 1986 or 
87, after a meeting with some reputable neighborhood crip members, the 90s were officially the West Side Rolling 90s Neighborhood Crips, making them one of the newer members of the Neighborhood Crips Club. And officially, mortal enemies with all members who stood under the Gangsta Crip Club, especially the A-Trade Gangsta Crips. But this intense gang war between the two really started after the death of a prominent member from the 90s named Hezalize. After that, it was war. The hatred on both sides runs so deep that there's been several fights, shootouts, and murders with several bodies being dropped on both sides with a crazy situation planned out in 2003. The unsuspecting can become the victims of gang violence just by wearing the wrong color. We can't like wear red because it's gang related and blue because they represent a, um, a certain gang. A guy comes up and, and, and he happens to be wearing a blue hat. Rival gang drives up, accuses him of being a gang member. They didn't believe his denials and kill him. On August 12, 2003, Shortly before 7.40 p.m., Henry Kill H, Douglas Watson, and James F. were fueling their Chevy Nova at an Arco gas station located on 76th Street and Western Avenue. This station was in a territory claimed by the A-Trade Gangsta Crips. Henry Kill H, Watson, and James F. weren't gang members. However, James F. was wearing an Allen Iverson jersey, commonly associated with the A-Trade Gangsta Crips. Well, noticing the jersey, Kevin Jones, a known member of the West Side Roller 90 Crips, drives his black two-door Ford Escort across the street to the gas station. As the vehicle approached the station, the passenger shouted, Fuck tramps! It's 90s! Not knowing what was going on, but knowing that they were in potential danger, Enrico H., Watson, and James entered their Chevy Nova and started to drive north on Western Avenue. They reached the intersection of Western Avenue and Florence and prepared to make a right turn on Florence. But Jones' vehicle appeared alongside the Chevy Nova as Jones flashed certain gang signs and the passenger aimed a small caliber weapon at the Chevy and fired 13 shots. To escape gunfire, Enrique H drove the Chevy into oncoming traffic, collided with another vehicle, and ultimately executed a successful turn on the Florence. Kenneth P, another driver in a different car, who was also attempting to make a turn on a Florence, was shot in the shoulder. And sadly, Watson sustained a fatal gunshot wound to his head. Jones was caught shortly after, and the trial court sentenced him to a term of 75 years of life. Growing up in Los Angeles, wearing our own colors or hats can end deadly for you. Sadly, this was the case for Watson. Rest in peace to that brother. This story right here is down there minor compared to all the other situations this gang is known for. And we're definitely addressing it all today. I was always a squabbler from the neighborhood crib gang. These are my trophies. Take a look. It's a gang of ass niggas that felt the wrath from the right and the left. On my mama, you can go from the east to the west and niggas know about this and know that that nigga there was one of the best. Who are the neighborhood rolling 90 cribs? The neighborhood Rolling 90 Crips are a predominantly African-American street gang located on the west side of South Central Los Angeles. When it comes to other races, they're definitely known to put them on as well. They have a few Mexicans, some Asians, and even a couple white members, including Cameron Terrell, who made headlines for the gang, which we'll definitely get into later. When it comes to their territory, they're based north of Century Boulevard, with their neighborhood stretching from Van Ness Avenue and Western Avenue between Manchester Boulevard and Century Boulevard, around Jesse Owens Park. The Rolling 90's main colors are sky blue and dark blue. Also, members are known to wear North Carolina caps with the letters NC, which represents the 90's. Members wear these colors, along with using their graffiti as a means of demonstrating power, marking territory, and as an intimidation tactic. But trust, these gangs, they've done way more than graffiti to intimidate other gangs. The Rolling Nani's name rings bells around the area and beyond because of how much this gang is known for. With activities ranging from gun battles, assassinations, walk down murders, extortion, and a lot of other crazy shit. Yeah, with that being said, if you see a 9-0, just run or call 5-0 because them boys is on go. 
bars, nigga. Nah, these violent means of operations mostly have to do with the Rolling 90s alliances. Yeah, I just f coochies up. Neighbor kid, Rolling 90 kid. F coochies, nigga. Neighbor kid. What the fuck is niggas talking about? The neighborhood Rolling 90 Crips are part of the Rolling No Car and fall under neighborhood umbrella and Deuce Car. So naturally, they're gonna be close to the gang members like the neighborhood Rolling 60s and the East Coast Crip. Because of the Rolling 90s alliances, they're mortal enemies to any trade car member, including gangs like the A-Trade Gangsta Crips and the Hoovers, who were still Gangsta Crips at that time. And this war is still going on to this day, with shootouts and murders between these gangs been a common occurrence. I seen two victims on the ground in front of the sidewalk and the other victim laying in the yard and the baby gasping for air as she was shot in the head. And it was terrible that they would ride by and kill an innocent kid. For example, late in the afternoon of November 26, 2005, police officers responded to a radio call concerning a shooting and discovered the body of Deja Vu Dorsey. The body was in an area known as the Bungalows, between 92nd Street and 94th, along Western Avenue in Los Angeles, California. The officers at the scene didn't locate any weapons on or around Dorsey's body. He had a tattoo indicating affiliation to the 11 dudes who were criminals. And after an autopsy, the medical examiner concluded that Dorsey died of a single through and through gunshot wound to the head with the back to front trajectory. The bungalows are claimed by the Royal 90s Crips Hasim Crito, also known by his game monitor, Crypto, was a member of the 90s. Henry Robertson was a member of the Roller 90s as well. He testified that on the afternoon of the shooting, he, Crypto, and between 20 and 30 members of the Roller 90s were hanging out in the alley between 92nd Street and 94th. Robertson heard Crypto either say, leave the alley or go to the front. Saying Crypto seemed to be talking to the entire group. Robertson left the alley and as he was walking away, he heard a gunshot from the alley. On top of that, he identified his fellow gang member, Crypto, out of a six-pack photographic lineup. He also gave the police a written statement, which read, I was in the alley when Crypto was like, go to the front. So I went to the front because I didn't want to see what was going to happen. Then I hear at least two or three shots. Also, Pierre Red, a former member of the Rolling 90s, said on the day of the shooting, he was a passenger in a car about to turn into the alley by the bungalows when he saw a crypto in a car on 94th Street, headed away from Western Avenue. Red spoke to Crypto, who told him, don't go down that way, something just happened. But Red, he proceeded to go down the alley where he saw a body. The next day, Crypto told Red what had happened. He said, Dorsey kept coming over there, asking him to buy a crap for $4. So Crypto, he took the $4 from Dorsey but didn't give him any crack. And when Dorsey kept returning, he got tired of the guy. In addition, he said another Rolling 90s member told Crypto that Dorsey was a member of the Hoover Gang. That's when Crypto got a gun from somebody and asked Dorsey one more time to leave, but he didn't respond. So as soon as Dorsey turned to leave, Crypto slowly walks up behind him and shoots him one time in the head. The jury heard evidence that Dorsey had an appearance of a person suffering from physical and mental disabilities, as well as substance abuse. A toxicity screen indicated the presence of alcohol, cocaine, and marijuana in his blood. In the end, Crypto was sentenced to 50 years to life. That's just one story. Trust, it's many more that involve the neighborhood Rolling 90 Cribs and the Hoovers, but most of them ended with a death on one side or another. But let's address the danger rating as we go over some more situations. This other home court came from Seahide, bomb blew me in the back of the head, I turned around, dug his ass out, then a third nigga came, you know what I'm saying, me and Cuz started locking, oh my mama, I was seeing him, then the security guards came, tried to get me to stop squabbling, and I stole on one of them, knocked him out, and then the guards was all over me, I got my head busted, they tried to subdue me, I fought them off me, and got up out of there, and escaped. That's how I went. Even the motherfuckers at the squat meet know that he telling the ring. The Korean lady that owned the t-shirt store in the sloth of squat meet, she remembered me, this black image. She'll say what she said then. 
Oh, you fight very well. You fight very well. Who is you? Oh, your boss is very big. Oh, neighborhood 90 Crips. Danger Raiden or the neighborhood Rolling 90 Crips? The neighborhood Rolling 90 Crips are going to receive a danger rating of a 9.4 out of 10 based off of the gang's long history of going to war with both the Hoovers and the A-Trey gangsters, stories of extortion and national drug rings, and their beautiful reputation in prison, jails, and on the streets. Yeah, try 9-0. Just pray you don't end up on the flow. And if they don't catch you now, they know to kick in those. Bars, nigga. Nah, seriously. The 9 0s have a lot of older stories that played out badly for their ops that are still talked about to this day. With the big one, Rolling 90s member Babu kicking his enemies out of their jail cells in Module 47 in LA County Jail. One by one, he made each enemy roll it up before making a module complete neighborhood and rolling no friendly. But that's in prison. When it comes to the streets, there have been several other deadly situations that this game was right in the middle of. For example, on May 17th of 2007, Juan Velasquez was found dead in a portable toilet at a construction site in Palmdale, California. Velasquez was stiff and his head was covered in dry blood. He died from blunt force trauma to the head. He had a skull fracture, broken nose, and cuts on his back from having been dragged. His head injuries were caused by his head having been slammed or stumped into the pavement. The blood and drag marts leading to the portable toilet started in the alley between 10th East Place and 10th Street East. Before that night, Felton Palmer, a resident of the apartment building next to the alley, part of an argument between DeAndre Tateman Jackson, a neighborhood Rolling 90 Crip member known as Bird, and a Latino man. He went outside to investigate, and Palmer recognized the Latino man. He had seen him in the alley a couple times. He also knew Bird. Palmer heard Burr yelling that the Latino man owed him $10, and he wasn't letting up. Matter of fact, Burr only grew more agitated, and soon after, a fight erupted between the two men. But the fight, it didn't last long. Burr quickly knocked him out. Thinking that the fight was done with, Palmer went back inside his apartment, but he heard female voices yelling, Burr, stop! One of those voices sounded like his neighbor. Darnisha Shavers. Palmer later went back out and saw the Latino man land in the alley. He heard someone say something about moving a body or moving him. And then the next morning, the alley was blocked off with police tape and Palmer suspected that the beating had something to do with it. On the night of Alaska's murder, Bird was standing with his girlfriend, Darnisha Shavers, on the second floor apartment in the same complex where Palmer lived. And it's alleged that they took ecstasy together on the night of the murder. On the day the body was discovered, detectives Ty Lobb and Martin Rodriguez asked Shavers who lived in her apartment. But she did not tell him Bird was in there sleeping in the bedroom. Bird left Shavers' apartment later that day after the police left the crime scene. When the sheriffs later searched Shavers' apartment, they found empty gauze and bandage packaging, which was purchased on the morning of Alaska's murder at a nearby liquor store. Shavers told the sheriffs that Burr had an injury on his hand, but the medical supplies were for a wound in the groin area. Shavers' friend, Latoya Jones, went to Shavers' apartment on the morning of Alaska's body was found to see what the police activity was about. Shavers was not home and Burr answered the door. Jones knew Bird because he and her husband sold drugs in the alley. When he answered the door, he said, a nigga need to stop taking these pills. I'm fucked up. In addition, she heard male voices in the back of the apartments talking about burning evidence. Ronald Jones, also known as Black, was arrested on suspicion of being an accessory to murder because he was cited for trespassing in the alley the day of the crime and was known to associate with Bird. He told the detective that Bird was from rolling 90s and Black was a blood, but the bloods allowed Bird to sell drugs in the alley because he was good at it and it benefited the neighborhood. Black, he didn't want to be labeled as a rat, but admitted that Shavers told him Burr went crazy and beat up a Mexican. Police found a pool of thick blood in a carport next to the alley. Also, a piece of cardboard at the construction site had a large blood stain on it. In addition, a Dodgers baseball cap 
was also found with blood stains on it. Criminalist Tiffany Shu tested the angle portion of Velasquez's sock for DNA. Since it appeared from the injuries to the back of his skull, the dirt debris in his hair, in the back of his shirt, and the bunching of his clothes, that he had been dragged to the portable bathroom by his ankles. Tests found a mixture of DNA matching Bird's and Velasquez. Bird was interviewed by sheriffs. He said he had seen Velasquez in the alley plenty of times, but he had never had any contact with him. When they asked whether Velasquez used to buy dope in the alley, Burr responded, I seen him come through. The alley where Velasquez was murdered is a high narcotics area and a blood territory. The fact that the blood submitted Bird, a rolling 90s crip member, to deal drugs near the territory demonstrates that he has a high status in their neighborhood. A gang status is hurt if debt remains unpaid and inflicting violence to collect these debts benefit the gang. Palmer knew Bird to be a member from the 90s. And sometime after he testified, he was a target of a shooting near his apartment. He said the shooter's yelled, punk ass snitch. He never had any problems before. So he believed that the shooting was a connection with his cooperation in the case. In the end, Deontay Trayman Jackson, also known as Bird, was sentenced to a term of life with a minimum of 15 years in prison. This story played out in Palmdale, but the 90s, they have situations just like this playing out all over Southern California, especially with their rivals. Rivals are the neighborhood Rolling 90 Crips. The Rolling 90s are allies of all gangs that fall under the neighborhood Crips and the Rolling O Crips, as well as the Hard Time Hustler Crips and the Redmond Avenue Crips. But that's pretty much it. They have a long list of rivals though, including the Inglewood Family Bloods, who were the gang's original rival, the Denver Lane Bloods, Crenshaw Mafia Bloods, Van Ness Gangster Bloods, and the Avenue Pyros. They also go at it with a lot of Crips. They're known a few with other Crip gangs affiliated with the Gangster Crips and the Hoover Gangs, as well as certain Mafias, especially the 9-9 Mafias and the Main Street Mafia Crips. But out of all these, there's just two that stand out amongst all of them. And the main reason for this stems from the alliances they once had with each other. Beef with the A-Tray Gangsters and all the Hoovers. The war with the neighborhood rolling on the Crips, as well as the Hoovers and the A-Tray Gangster Crips, goes back to the 1980s. At first, the 90s, they were cool with both gangs. Matter of fact, they were actually allies of each other, with some 90s being from Hoovers and some being gangsters. But the tensions start to rise between these gangs after several fights and deadly situations at San Andrews Park. Because of this, the 90s start to split away from the Hoovers and the Gangster Crips. And by 1986, the Rolling 90 Gangster Crips and the Rolling 90 Hoovers merged together to become the West Coast 90 Crips, before officially becoming the neighborhood Rolling 90s after a meeting with several prominent Crip gangs, which ultimately helped to jumpstart a war with the Gangster Crips and the Hoovers, which has only intensified over the years. Sadly, there's been a lot of bodies dropped on both sides with several situations making headlines over the years. But a big one made national headlines back in 2017. God knows what really happened that day and God knows what was in my head that day. Terrell seemed to be living a double life, attending high school in Palos Verdes, but escaping to hang out with friends in South Los Angeles. In 2016, a white kid from the highly wealthy area of Palos Verdes named Cameron Terrell started hanging out at Jesse Owens Park in Los Angeles, California after his parents were having issues at home. And this park has been a main hangout for the Rolling 90s neighborhood Crips since the 1980s. At the park, Terrell became friends with a teenager who would later join the Rolling 90s Crips, which enticed Cameron to eventually join, which a lot of people didn't think made sense considering his background. One resident near Jesse Owens Park was surprised by Terrell's presence in the neighborhood, thinking, who is he? What is he doing here? After joining the Rolling 90s and giving the nickname Milk, the members took advantage. Terrell would give away his clothing to gang members, his money, and even let them borrow his luxury car. And as his first year as a member, he earned some respect amongst his peers, even appearing in a music video released by Rolling 90s crib rapper Chico, in which Terrell could be seen wearing a blue bandana, which is often worn by members of the Crip gang. To be honest, 
you'll see white gang members all throughout Los Angeles. But this case, it was completely different for most of them. Terrell's family, they came from money, like a lot of it. But at that time, in the area Terrell was in, none of that mattered. He was from rolling 90s now. It was time to put in work. On October 1st of 2007, at around 11.26 a.m., using his father's Mercedes Benz, Terrell drove two other gang members from the rolling 90s neighborhood Crips to the 7800 block of Southwestern Avenue, which is the territory of a rival gang, the A-Tray Gangsta Crips. Terrell would later claim that he thought the two other gang members were going to spray graffiti over their territory of their rivals as he waited in the car. But as Terrell waited, the two gang members approached 21-year-old Justin Holmes, who was with two other friends. Once close enough, the two members banged on the group. Right after that, the group runs away, but Holmes, he doesn't move. And gets asked, where you from again? But Holmes replied, I don't gang bang. But none of that mattered, as one of the gang members shot Holmes. The two gang members then ran back to Terrell's car was sped off. Holmes was taken to a hospital where he was unfortunately pronounced dead. The rolling 90s, they were soon arrested for the murder. During Terrell's trial, the DA said they came in the middle of the day to kill somebody and they didn't care. He also played a video taken from Terrell's phone on the night of the murder, showing him in what appears to be a bathroom throwing up gang signs. The case made headlines when Terrell's wealthy family posted $5 million bail and he returned to classes at his high school. DA's court is saying he went home that evening. He let everyone know how proud he is. He also said, murder is the extreme crime that can show that you're down for the game. Through all this, Terrell admitted to being the driver of the black Mercedes Benz registered to his father that was caught on surveillance video. During the trial, prosecutors showed video they say Terrell took of his friends kicking candles at the victim's memorial. But he was still acquitted for the murder. Several critics, they acknowledged the racial dynamics at play. He wasn't set free because he was white, said the attorney, who was black. But I do think that the jurors gave him the benefit of the doubt. I don't think the other minorities had that. A local was also quoted saying, we got James a man like that. Also, we don't have that many opportunities. Terrell graduated from high school while his case was pending, and as of today, he's at the University of Houston. Terrell now says he plans to attend the University of Houston and go to law school. If you guys want an in-depth insight on what went down, definitely check out Hood Politics or Travel or Ross. Plus, it's honestly plenty of other channels who cover the situation as well. Still, rest in peace to Holmes, he got caught up in the middle of a daily war between the 90s and the A-Trey gangsters. But I couldn't at least tell you guys the 90s histories without informing you guys about that situation. Trust, it's gonna be part of the history forever because I don't see any of their enemies letting them forget it. But honestly, his membership was brief and minor compared to other reputable members and prominent figures who put in work for this game. Prominent figures. The rolling nineties have been around for over five decades. And throughout all that time past, they've had more than a few members who have helped the gang earn its respect in Los Angeles. But I found a list of members who are no longer with us. A few of them include Donald Mitchell, TC, and Big Red. Rest in peace to them. Y'all let me know in the comments of any of the members who are no longer with us. Let their names live on. On top of that, they've had more than a few other members who are very reputable when it comes to Los Angeles game politics. Some of them include OG Cadillac, Cody Brown, Space Ghost, King Dog, Nine Bang, Forty, Lil Donut, Mouse, Big Miz, P Twin, Crispy, Lil Smokey, Iceman, G Down, Jelly Roll, Willie Lunch Meat, Big Too Sweet, Dirt Dog, Insane, 
Crazy, Bojack, Swat, Baby Donut, Papa Bird, Lil Bird, Bird, and Babo, who was responsible for the hostile takeover of Maja 47. In addition, the 90s, they've had more than a few rappers repping the gang over the years. Go get a KB, yeah, bro, it's hard. He first came into the scene after releasing N8s to the N8s about six years ago. And he's been doing his thing ever since. But I did find some rumors saying he got put off. Y'all let me know in the comments if it is true or not. Also, it's Chico, who's been doing his thing over the years. After the Neighborhood Anthem was released, he's been dropping fire ever since then. Y'all definitely tap in ASAP. It's also Robbie O, c Dudes, Western Half CJ, Gutter Boy, and Cinco. Hey, I almost forgot though. Y'all remember this? I got these neighborhood extras, I'ma get them what they want. I've been playing in the park, little boy don't want no smoke. When you hop out with that piss, you better get him, better not choke. I'ma show you all the ropes, I'ma show you how to be a low. Yeah, shout out to Fat Jack. In my opinion, bro's the hardest rapper coming out of the 90s right now. Dope hooks, and a nigga can rap his ass off, I ain't gonna lie. Y'all niggas are definitely tap in ASAP. And let me know in the comments if I'm leaving out any other artists, man. Let's get that music heard. Current state of the neighborhood Roller 90 Crips. The Roller 90 Crips have been through several transitions since the gang's foundation. Some were Hoovers, some were gangsters. But once the gangs decided to drop both monikers, join together, and roll with a neighborhood car, the name really started to ring bells around the city. That's why when it comes to the current state of the neighborhood Roller 90 Crips, today, they remain one of the most active gangs in Los Angeles. And with more than a few prominent members and foot soldiers, the gang has continued to grow and thrive in the city. The gang's growth can be seen in the fact that they have cliques in several different states, including Alabama, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, New Orleans, New York, and South Carolina. But y'all let me know in the comments if I'm leaving out your state. Anyways, that's it for the neighborhood Roller 90 Cribs. Y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? Did I get anything wrong? Did I miss something? Y'all let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you fuck with this video. Are you a part of the danger game? Y'all stay safe for dangers out there.